Good afternoon, everybody. Today I will be speaking to you regarding the legend of little Jimmy Webb and his dressing table. Scholars have recognized the significance of the Hillsborough School dressing table at the Museum of Early Southern Decorative Arts for more than a generation. It has been included in two publications since 1977, but little formal investigation of the table has occurred. Mesa curators have attributed the table to Hillsborough, North Carolina between 1765 and 1785, since they associated it with a group of tables and chairs commonly referred to as the Hillsborough School. Legend states that North Carolina Governor Thomas Burke gave the table to the Webb family of Hillsborough, but the family patriarch, Dr. James Webb, was only nine years old at the time of Governor Burke's death. Also, Webb was living in neighboring Granville County at the time. This project proposes a more plausible theory of the Mesda table's descent as it explores the known history of the Hillsborough School of Tables and Chairs. Available evidence suggests that a carpenter working in the same period of the Hillsborough School may have dabbled in cabinet making as well. For centuries, the table has served as a household furnishing. By the 18th century, an abundance of specialty table forms have entered the furniture lexicon with names such as breakfast, sideboard, card, writing, and dressing tables. The Mesda table fits the similar description and size of a typical dressing table form identified elsewhere in the 18th century. However, its function and actual use in the ritual of dressing is not so certain. Based on what appears to be several ink stains found inside the drawer, owners likely used the Mesda table for writing, at least some of the time. Signs of the table being used for dressing are missing as well. The drawer has no evidence of ever having dividers, and the top shows no wear from having a dressing box or dressing glass resting on it. Therefore, the dual functionality of the Mesda table is a viable concept. The Mesda table is made of native black walnut with yellow pine as a secondary wood. The two board top with a molded edge and slight overhang on all four sides is attached to the case with screws. The sides and back of the case is tenoned to the leg posts with two pegs and the front skirt is tenoned with one peg. The carved astragals on the front and side skirts are common architectural decorative elements seen from uh, anywhere from gravestones to furniture to uh, stairways and porch banisters. A single drawer extends the full width of the front skirt and has three lift edges, which keep the drawer from resting flush with the case. The drawer has a brass escutcheon plate nailed to the front with a lock behind and two original brass poles attached to pierced plates. One of the pierced plates was likely broken due, uh, prior to its initial application because the finish where the break was appears consistent with the table. And you can see the, the entire pierce plate here and then the section that is broken off. And it's very rough along these couple of edges here. The drawer sides are secured to the front and back with three crude dovetails and the tops of the drawer sides are rounded. The drawer bottom is set in a groove on the sides and is nailed into place. The turned legs begin with a baluster turning near the leg posts, starting up here, and then up here, and taper to carved ball and claw feet with three facing toes and one behind. Nearly the entire table retains its original appearance, save for a couple of replacement screws and a replaced drawer runner. If the Mesda curators had not associated the table with other furniture from Hillsboro, it could be mistaken for a Virginia or coastal North Carolina made table since its characteristics of tidewater styles. The strongly projecting uh, pad feet or ball and claw feet, uh, in addition to the baluster turnings on several of these tables, uh, you can see here even an astral carved skirt, and then the lack of the, the, the top drawer rail just above the drawer there and there as well are all present on, on styles from Tidewater and uh, Coastal North Carolina furniture. However, the appearance and method of its construction suggests it was likely made outside of the major craftsman towns of Tidewater, Virginia, and Coastal North Carolina. Knotted, lesser quality walnut planks are used for the top boards and rear of the case. 
The proper left front leg has an additional uh, has an additional mortise carved into it that uh, was filled with a non-functioning peg. This craftsmanship suggests the leg might have been meant for use on the back or was simply an extra leg in the shop. Also, the ball and claw feet are not commonly found on turned, tapered legs from Tidewater, Virginia or coastal North Carolina furniture of that time period. They most often appear on cabriole legs. And as the original finner suggests, as I mentioned before, the proper left brass plate was broken before it was attached to the door frame. These factors led curators to associate the table with that country construction, especially since the baluster turned legs, astral carved skirt, and heavily molded top edge implies that a carpenter, far more prevalent in the back country than a cabinet maker, designed and constructed the table. But where was he working in the back country? Hillsborough was an important 18th century North Carolina backcountry center for trade and commerce. Founded in 1754 on the Eno River, it was one of the earliest towns founded in the colony's backcountry. It grew significantly due to its prominence as the location of the Orange County Courthouse and its situation upon a major crossroads of the trading path from Petersburg, Virginia to Salisbury, North Carolina. Here too were connections to Halifax and Newbern in the coastal region of North Carolina. The town quickly became the political, social, and economic center of the entire backcountry. Future Georgia congressman and then Hillsborough resident, William Few, described the town in 1764 as the metropolis of the county, where courts were held and all the public business was done. It was a small village which contained about 30 or 40 inhabitants with two or three small stores and two or three ordinary taverns. But it was an improving village Several Scotch merchants were soon after induced to establish stores that contained a good assortment of European merchandise, which changed the state of things for the better. A church, courthouse, and jail were built, but there was no parson or physician. Two or three attorneys opened their offices here and found employment. French surveyor Claude Savier uh, traveled through North Carolina and the backcountry, and he drew the town of Hillsborough in 1768 and it best illustrates Few's description. Sauvier includes the major features of the town, including the Episcopal Church, courthouse, jail, market house, mills, spring, and even the race ground, which was symbolic of a very genteel society. As a result of Hillsborough's fast growth, it also became a center for conflict and state politics in the 1770s and 1780s. The regulator movement of unhappily taxed farmers and peasants, seen here in the foreground, culminated in the 1771 Battle of the Alamance and the trial and execution that followed. Hillsborough would go on to host the North Carolina Provincial Congress in 1775 and, after independence was declared, the state legislatures in 1778 and 1782. In these years, Thomas Burke rose to prominence. Burke moved to Hillsboro in 1772 and settled on his farm, Tyaquin, just north of town. He served North Carolina as a delegate in the Provincial Congress in 1775, a member of the Continental Congress from 1777 to 1781, and the following year he was elected governor, where he just served for a brief year and a half and then died shortly thereafter in 1783. He left a widow and an infant daughter behind in Hillsboro. Hillsborough lost any hope of officially being named the state capital when it failed to ratify the U.S. Constitution during the 1788 state convention that was held there. The convention reconvened the following year in Fayetteville and the Constitution was ratified there. Then in 1792, Raleigh was laid out as the state capital and the University of North Carolina was formed with the town of Chapel Hill surrounding it. Though no longer a center for state politics, Hillsborough remained an important center for trade and commerce but experienced a slower growth and development. In 1795, Dr. James Webb arrived in Orange County as a student at the University of North Carolina. He established himself as a physician, merchant, and would later become a philanthropist in Hillsboro in 1799. He would later help found the North Carolina State Medical Society, as well as several schools in Hillsboro. In preparation for his marriage in 1807, he purchased five one-acre lots where he built his house, medical office, and barn. 
In 1810, Governor Burke's daughter, who looks surprisingly much like her father, <laughs> purchased the house and lot adjacent to Dr. Webb. Then by 1817, Miss Burke and Dr. Webb had become friends. Dr. Webb agreed to sell a portion of his land to Miss Brooke and build the log schoolhouse seen behind uh, you know, the present day house now as a school to teach the Webb's nine children and other children of his neighbors. Miss Polly Burke's school was in operation from about 1818 to 1834 when Miss Burke sold most of her household goods and moved to Marion, Alabama with her niece's family. In 1837, Miss Burke named Dr. Webb her power of attorney to dispose of her remaining Hillsborough property and belongings. This history suggests that Dr. Webb may indeed have acquired the table from a Burke, but a strong association with Polly Burke is far more likely than a gift from a governor to a child. Therefore, Dr. Webb could have acquired the Mesda table, could not have acquired the Mesda table from Governor Burke, but from his daughter, either directly or through the sale of her possessions. The legend of little Jimmy Webb's dressing table has simply been overstated by one generation. Polly Burke's sale may have also yielded other furniture from the Hillsborough School. Local newspaper publisher, Dennis Hart, purchased the Burke property in 1837, renamed it Hart Seas, and added on to the house. Mesda curators have recorded two corner chairs and two side chairs as having a Hart Seas provenance. A corner chair also descended in the Webb family with the same reputed story of having once belonged to Governor Burke. Additionally, Mesda curators have identified another corner chair and five side chairs as part of the Hillsborough School. Each of these chairs share some common elements, including Marlboro legs, intricate pierced or ribbed splats, shaped crest rails, reeded styles, inverted hearts, and again, the use of walnut as a primary wood. Mesda curators have also recorded two additional dressing tables, one dining table and one desk as part of the Hillsborough School. Each of these share common features, including baluster turned tapered legs, ball and claw or pad feet, scalloped or astragal carved skirts, and the use of walnut as the primary wood. The two dressing tables and dining table were recorded as having descended in the family of Richard Benahan. Benahan moved to North Carolina from Virginia in 1762 and operated a store about 15 miles northeast of Hillsboro. Benahan was a successful merchant and by 1800 he owned over 4,000 acres and 44 slaves at his Stagville plantation. His oldest daughter, Rebecca, married Hillsboro lawyer Duncan Cameron in 1803 and they proceeded to construct their home Farintosh near Stagville, 15 miles away in 1810. The dining table from the Hillsborough School was recorded with a history from Farintosh. Interestingly enough, Cameron acquired his property in Hillsborough from Dr. James Webb in 1800. And also, Webb served as a second in a duel Duncan Cameron fought and won with another Hillsborough lawyer in 1803. Cameron's son, Paul Cameron, also practiced law in Hillsborough and in 1834 constructed his home Burnside on the outskirts of town. I was unable to get close enough to take a picture of the house. Mesa curators recorded at Burnside the final two dressing tables from the Hillsborough School. So who was the possible carpenter working in Hillsborough from 1765 to 1785 that was constructing furniture as well? The Mesda Craftsman database records 13 carpenters and cabinet makers working near Hillsborough prior to 1790. Only one of these craftsmen, Martin Hunter, has a direct link to any member of the Burke, Webb, Benahan, or Cameron families of Hillsborough. In 1787, Palmer worked for Richard Benahan and built his Stagville store, lumber house, and shed. Then in 1790, Palmer likely began construction on the Benahan home, Stagville. Palmer arrived from Bertie County, North Carolina, and first appeared in public records there in 1766. But he was in Orange County by 1771, where he was listed in the military rolls. And in the 1779 tax list, he was worth over 2,000 pounds, today approximately 350,000 US dollars. 
Palmer is recorded often in official Orange County records as a house carpenter and house joiner. His wealth and numerous court-appointed projects signify his solid reputation that his woodworking skills earned him. He remained in Hillsboro the rest of his life. In addition to the structures he built for Benahane, Palmer also built hardscrabble for William Kane in Hillsboro in 1790. He also made repairs and conversions to several colonial buildings following the revolution, including the Orange County Courthouse in 1784. He remodeled the St. Matthew's Episcopal Church in 1784 and the Blue House Store in 1790, where he is recorded as having built, thank you, Gene, shelves and a table. This clearly proves that Palmer, a carpenter, also built furniture in Hillsboro while serving as a carpenter and a joiner. Palmer is first listed in 1785, purchasing land in a Quaker farming community north of Hillsboro, and then in 1795, acquires property in town. Between 1800 and 1830, he owned 10 to 15 slaves who were engaged in agriculture. Some of these slaves may have been trained in a woodworking trade, though none have been identified thus far. Palmer's son, William Palmer, followed in his father's footsteps as a carpenter, but he is listed as a cabinet maker in 1799 when he built a writing table for the merchants Hogg and Adams. Then in 1802, he built several pieces of furniture in Hillsboro for Duncan Cameron. Because research is yet to discover William serving as an apprentice to a cabinet maker, Palmer likely learned the woodworking trades from his father. As mentioned previously, it would have been likely that a carpenter or joiner would also be making furniture in the 18th century backcountry of North Carolina. In fact, Bertie County, where Martin Palmer arrived from, furniture maker William Say, otherwise known as the WH cabinet maker, was recorded as being a house carpenter and house joiner, though his furniture is acknowledged by signed examples. Martin Palmer and his son William were certainly capable of operating one of 18th century Hillsboro's most prolific cabinet making shops and are recorded as having worked for the owners of some of the furniture categorized by the Hillsboro School. Therefore, the Mezzo table's attribution to Martin or William Palmer is entirely plausible if the 1765 to 1785 period of construction is indeed correct. For this project to be further explored, the Quaker records in Orange County may prove useful as Martin Palmer lived in a Quaker community and maintained a farm there throughout his life. A visit to the Southern Historical Collection at the University of North Carolina would also be imperative. This collection contains the papers of Governor Thomas Burke, Dr. James Webb, Richard Benahan, Duncan Cameron, and other very prominent residents of Hillsboro in the late 18th century. New discoveries of furniture or services performed by Martin or William Palmer may lay buried in these papers. Thank you. <laughs>